Hello everyone, I'm Shujah Nawaz and on behalf of the Atlantic Council and the American Pakistan Foundation, I want to welcome you to this very special occasion, a conversation on a book called The Bhutto Dynasty by Owen Bennett Jones. Um, Owen Bennett Jones is a well-known name around the world uh, as a BBC foreign correspondent and also as the sometime host of the BBC World Services News Hour. Um, he's the author of Pakistan in the Eye of the Storm, uh, which is a comprehensive analysis of pa Pakistan's role in the global war on terrorism. Uh, and his knowledge of that uh, interesting terrain uh, led him into a foray into fiction uh, with a book called uh, Target Britain that uh, somehow manages to tie Balochistan in London um, intercontinentally um, in a web of intrigue and, and danger. He also writes a regular column for Dawn, uh, a major newspaper in Pakistan, and you should see his column in today's paper, which talks about the situation inside Pakistan. Uh, and now he is associated with Audi Limited, which is a new venture to support podcasts, something that he has himself been involved in. His new book, The Bhutto Dynasty, uh, tells the necessary and important story of how a new political party, the Pakistan People's Party, emerged uh, to displace a military dictatorship in Pakistan in the late 1960s and gradually transmogrified itself uh, into a dynastic order rooted in the feudal roots of its founder, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto. It's a riveting tale. Uh, based on deep reportage and sleuthing uh, with some delicious and titillating details that sometimes verge on the edge of gossip, but which he supports with, with good sourcing and copious citations and telling details, uh, all uh, hallmarks of a, a superb trained journalist. The other uh, guests and commentators who are going to join us uh, in this conversation are Madiha Afzal. She's the David Rubenstein Fellow in Foreign Policy Program at the Brookings Institution and author of a book on Pakistan called Pakistan Under Siege, Extremism, Society and the State. And uh, if his uh, technical difficulties allow him, we will also be joined by Hassan Abbas, an author among others of the recent book, oh, there he is, uh, of uh, a recent book called Pakistan's Nuclear Bomb, a story of defiance, deterrence, and deviance. Uh, he's now the professor and chair of the Department of Regional and Analytical Studies at the National Defense University um, in Washington, DC, uh, at their College of International Security Affairs. Um, then we will be joined also by Kamran Bukhari. Uh, he's the author of a number of books on political Islam. Um, and he is now currently the Director of Analytical Development at the Center for Global Policy, uh, also in Washington, DC. And then Shamila Chaudhary, who's a former senior White House official in the um, National Security Council of President Obama, and currently the president of the American Pakistan Foundation. And they are co-hosting, as I said, this event today. Um, we invite the audience to join us uh, with their questions uh, through the Q&A function. Uh, and my colleagues at the Atlantic Council uh, have kindly agreed to collate those questions and share them with me uh, on my cell phone so that I can then try and get as many of them before you and before Owen Bennett Jones. Uh, so welcome uh, to Owen Bennett Jones. And Owen, let me start by asking you a basic question as to what drew you to Pakistan in the first place and what maintains your interest in this country? Oh, well, it's a, it's a great place for journalists to work. I mean, everyone is so indiscreet and uh, so wonderfully willing to talk about what's going on. Uh, and there's a lot going on. You know, there's constant crisis, really. I mean, I, I, I don't say that with any sense of joy for the Pakistani people. But the fact is that uh, as, a, as a new journalist, it, it never ceases to deliver the most extraordinary events at a very rapid pace. Uh, so really, it, it, it's, a, it's a dream place for a foreign correspondent, I'd say. 
Excellent. Well, I think that's probably why a number of foreign correspondents have ended up writing books about the country. Uh, what uh, led you to the idea of, of this book? Uh, how did this emerge? Well, I just thought that um, it hadn't been done and that, you know, they obviously are very important to uh, Pakistan's history, but, but also that they have had so much interaction with the West that they're sort of very visible and, and people have heard of them and have met them and have dealt with them. So it did seem to be quite a good vehicle for telling Pakistan story as well as the family story. And I was quite keen to find out about the colonial stuff, which I didn't really know about. So that was um, yeah, just interesting to go to the British Library and read all that stuff and, and, and see what connections they'd had with the British colonial authorities way back, which turns out to be lots of connections. Uh, so, so yeah, it just seemed to me a, a rich topic and a good way of uh, yeah, explaining Pakistan through a, through, a, through a most dramatic and unceasingly eventful family story. Well, of course, the story begins with Zulfikar Ali Bhutto. And for those of us who uh, were lucky enough to have seen him and observe him and, and cover him um, uh, in, in his rise to power um, from being a, just a minister in the Ayub Khan cabinet. He was a remarkable figure, uh, a melange of, of West and East, much like his daughter was, uh, dedicated to reading, uh, learning and activism. Uh, he could have had a very comfortable life a, as a, a rich man and as a lawyer, but he chose to, to, to do a lot uh, for the common people in Pakistan. Uh, now, uh, let's, let me ask you, based on the research that you've done, uh, if you think that uh, any one of his children or grandchildren are really going to be up to his standard, um, and why were you unable to gain access to his family archives uh, in 60 Clifton? Uh, well, let's deal with the archives, first of all. I mean, the family are very suspicious of, um, of people writing about them, I think it's fair to say. And so, uh, and there are obviously various factions of the family, if I can put it like that, uh, or at least groups within the family, maybe a kinder way of putting it. Uh, so so uh, getting access to anything is extremely complicated. And um, there was a biography of Sulfur Kauri Bhutto, which the family didn't much enjoy, I think. So since then, they've been uh, quite nervous about uh, trusting anyone with information and so the, the, the attitude basically seems to be that they just hoard all the information they've got and uh, and don't don't let people uh, get to it so uh, that you know is 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 the difficulty of writing about them in that they are yeah they're nervous about and and, and the, i guess the point is that their reputation matters you know it still matters politically um and they are active politically and Bilal Bhutto is obviously totally in the game and and, and trying to become uh, the leader of the country you know, the third generation. Uh, so all this image stuff, you know, stories about the family are politically relevant. Um, do you think that history will regard Benazir Bhutto as, uh, as the most famous of the Bhutto dynasty? I see you put her on the cover of your book also. Well, that was partly because I mean, people have written about Sulfur before. And I mean, so I had quite a lot, I hope, of fresh material, particularly on, on um, the plot to assassinate uh, Benazir Bhutto. But yes, I mean, I, I, I suspect that that is the case. She, and she was highly visible in the, in, in the media, the Western media, in a way that Zulfikar could never have been because the media wasn't uh, the same as it is uh, now. And, and as for Asif Sadari, I mean, he's had his time in power, her, her widower, uh, without making much impact on Western opinion, certainly. And we, we'll see about the son. I mean, I think it is quite possible he you know, he, he, he could, he could uh, succeed in his ambitions, uh, whether he'll become, and he is young, so, you know, who knows? I mean, but whether he'll have quite the charisma of his mother, I don't know. Well, you mentioned the assassination. Uh, you've done a, a, an award-winning podcast on that, uh, which is uh, extremely interesting and highly regarded. Um, talk to me about the assassination. Uh, can you tell me who you really hold responsible for it? Uh, and well, it was. Um, did her party fail her in in securing her uh, physically at the site of the the speech and her departure, uh, or was it a failure of the the Musharraf regime? Well, um, to be fair, it's just I mean just to. There's a lot in that, uh, but the night before, I mean, it's always worth remembering that the night before she was killed. Uh, 
at one o'clock in the morning, in fact, of the day she was killed, the head of the ISI did go to her home and said, you're about to be killed. Don't, you know, there's a high risk you'll be killed. There is a plot to kill you and you need to take care and you shouldn't be going to this rally that you're planning to attend. So to that extent, uh, an element of the state did actually do its work and tried to protect her. Uh, but I think other elements of the state um, were complicit in her murder. It was um, commissioned by... Uh, a joint commission by Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, uh, both working together, had a shared interest in it. And it was undertaken, both the first attempt to kill her in Karachi before she was actually killed in Rawalpindi, uh, were both undertaken by the Pakistan Taliban, who deployed, amazingly on the day, 15-year-olds uh, who actually killed her. She was killed by a bunch of 15-year-olds. So it, th th there was a, a Taliban Al-Qaeda a direct role in, in actually doing it. Uh, the uh, state, I think some elements within the state um, didn't just turn a blind eye, but actually facilitated uh, what happened. And there was afterwards the most extraordinary cover up as the uh, state tried to prevent the United Nations quite good investigation actually getting anywhere. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it's a long and complicated story, but that, that, that summarizes it. So are you saying, in fact, that the, the state uh, not only knew about the attack, but that elements of the state were involved in the planning uh, or uh, in, in connect, uh, they were connecting with the people that did the planning and the execution? So it gets very, very murky because are these people who are retired uh, state officials, are they serving state officials, are they uh, in knowledge of what's happening, are they trying to just let things be, are they actually facilitating, and all that is unclear still. Uh, but, uh, you know, and whether Musharraf had any knowledge of it, I simply don't know, and I have no reason to say he did. I mean, he denies it very strongly, he's always denied it. He has said himself in an interview with me that he thought some elements of the military might have been involved, uh, and, you know, uh, I think that's that's right. But whether it's the military or the ISI, retired, serving, unclear. But I think what is clear is that there is a section of the establishment that has close contacts with violent jihadists and sometimes crosses the line in terms of failing to either prevent attacks or maybe even facilitate them. I mean, it's quite clear that uh, if they... Uh, warned Benazir Bhutto the night before the attack that they had some information. It's also possible, as Musharraf had tried, to keep her from going public uh, and addressing the public. He tried to stop her from coming back to Pakistan with the same kind of threat. Um, so what makes it more interesting is that the day after the assassination, they come up with uh, the actual recording and transcript of a conversation that they captured between the alleged perpetrators. So uh, it would imply that they, they had much more than just a, a hunch that something was happening. No, that's right. I mean, uh, the, the warning that she received in the small hours of the day she was killed was quite specific. And from what I understand, was pretty well informed as to what had happened. And she not unreasonably said, well, if you know I'm about to be attacked, why don't you go and arrest the people who are going to do it? Uh, to which she was told, well, we can't do that because it would compromise our sources. I mean, she did believe that they were trying to prevent her holding these rallies, and she's probably right. You know, but in the event, on this occasion, we know that the ISI was well informed. I mean, you know, it, it did happen. And they did predict, you know, less than 24 hours before that it would happen. Well, obviously, the result was a watershed moment in Pakistani politics because uh, one of its most powerful and, and brilliant politicians was removed from the scene. When you look back on her life, and I know that you covered her extensively, what did you think was her greatest achievement and what was her greatest failure? Well, like a lot of these politicians, I mean, whether it's her father or, or, or her, or may I say, you know, some of the, some of the yeah, people in the, in the States and the UK, everywhere else. I mean, the, the, the greatest moment in political careers is often, I guess, in the ascendant as uh, hope is, uh, you know, spread and uh, people are inspired to 
think that the world could change. Uh, and Zulfikarli Bhutto clearly had just the most powerful rise to power in this astonishing sort of period of four or five years where he captured the hearts of uh, so many Pakistani people. And Benazir, you know, not to that extent in her rise, but also uh, did fill people with great hope that uh, this highly educated, sophisticated woman, uh, and the first uh, woman to reach such heights in a Muslim country uh, could produce real change. Uh, so uh, that coupled with her astonishing physical bravery, um, which was consistent and just so impressive, uh, you know, are, I think her greatest attributes, her, her problem was that in power, she never really managed to get her agenda pushed through. Uh, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto failed to a lesser degree, perhaps, but, you know, in her governments, they were short. Uh, she was always up against the establishment who didn't trust her. Uh, one of the things I say in the book is that I think the nuclear issue was probably more important than is generally understood, that the nuclear issue may well have been a key factor in lending, leading to the end of her first government, and I think also in her death, where the establishment basically didn't trust her not to uh, reveal things about Pakistani proliferation. So I, I, I suspect that the nuclear issue was uh, yeah, the immediate cause, or one of the immediate causes of her political difficulties, but it, whatever the cause is, she, she failed to get her agenda through. I mean, I'm not saying she's the only civilian politician to have failed to do that in Pakistan, but she did. When you mention the nuclear proliferation issue, I, I should let the audience know that there's some remarkable detail that you've pulled together from different sources about her own involvement in particularly the discussions and a visit to North Korea, uh, which because North Korea is in the news again, uh, nowadays uh, might be quite interesting for people. Um, let me move on to a husband who succeeded her as the party head. Um, do you think he's going to be an integral part of the Bhutto legacy? Uh, and what will be his own legacy? It's interesting. I, I hadn't really appreciated before researching the book that there had been an effort by him, or at least the thought had obviously occurred to him, to uh, switch the focus of the dynasty from the Bhutos to the Zadaris, and that uh, he had made a few tentative steps along those lines with his sister and uh, trying to slew Bilal away from uh, the Bhutos towards the Zadaris. Uh, but it's, I think he probably accepted I mean, I, this is not on the basis of any conversation with him, but just looking at what actually happened, uh, I, I, I think he probably accepted that that wasn't going to happen. Uh, and that, uh, you know, the Bhutto name is the source of the, the, the family's power and that it wouldn't be possible to create a Zadari legacy of the same kind. I mean, in terms of his, you know, public, his policy, his government, I mean, he did achieve this thing, which his wife never did of surviving a full term. Uh, he did it largely by agreeing to whatever anyone wanted. I mean, he wasn't a man with any political ideology or great agenda to come into power with. He, 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 it was all about power management, if you like, and he successfully did it and uh, lasted the full term. But that means in policy terms, there's not uh, a huge legacy. You know, there was a decentralization measure and so on. And there, were, there were things that were of some significance, but, but uh, I think the most remarkable thing is that he was so good at doing deals that he survived. Uh, you use the, uh, some terms about lack of political ideology. Uh, one could describe almost all the dynastic parties in Pakistan using those words. Uh, it doesn't look as if they have any solid ideology that they want to bring on, uh, except for the religious parties. But um, they, they don't seem to, uh, they're ready to make deals, let's put it that way. Um, to, to, get to make compromises. I suppose that's true of all politicians. I mean, the, 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 the Bhutto's would claim that they're secularist relatively, that they're leftist relatively, uh, that they do have a commitment to democracy. Uh, however, they do work with the army. Uh, they have made money, a lot of money, and they have uh, not necessarily lived to the extent up to their socialist ideals. And so, yes, I mean, I think uh, it's difficult to point to politicians who've uh, stuck to their programs rigidly in any culture or, or country, but certainly they've made compromises.
do you think that the dynastic uh, parties, and there are quite a few in Pakistan, have a future? Well, they're all dynastic almost, aren't they? Except for Jamat Lami, perhaps. So it is, it is perhaps under appreciated that it's, I mean, even the smallest Baluch party will be a dynastic party and the, 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 the parties in the Northwest and so on. Uh, so, so it is something that has affected all of Pakistani politics. Um, you know, the, 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 the Indian example suggests that it won't last. However, I think people would say Bilal is making a much better stab of it than the current generation of the Gandhi family. Uh, so can he do it again? Maybe. Does dynastic politics deliver uh, I have to say, I mean, I've had a quite open mind about it when I started, and it seems to me that there's no, it'd be very difficult to make a claim that they use that leverage they've got, this political capital they've got, this sort of automatic base they've got, to any greater effect than someone who creates their own base. Uh, so I haven't been able to detect anything in the outcomes that suggest that dynastic politics delivers uh, particularly more than any normal party. Thank you. At this point, I think I'd like to bring in uh, my colleagues. So um, if Madhya Afzal could uh, join us and ask her question or give her comment, I'd appreciate it. Sure. Um, thank you, um, Shuja and Owen, for that, uh, for that great discussion. I think I'd like to just um, continue sort of talking um, with you a little bit about um, the political fortunes of the PPP as you see them. Um, so you, you mentioned that Bilawal aspires to be the leader of the country. I mean, post-2013, it really looks like the PPP is now relegated to being a party that's a, a, to a party that dominates Sindh, but little else. So I don't necessarily see a path to uh, you know, its political fortunes changing in, in Punjab unless something within the party changes. You know, Bilawal holds little appeal there. And Punjab, I think, is going to, if, if it is um, going to switch between parties, it's the PMLN and the PTI. So I wonder what you think of um, the, the PPP's fortunes going forward. Um, is Bilawal going to be the leader of the party? What might change um, uh, in order for the PPP to have a realistic stab at anything other than Sindh going forward? Well, I mean, you know, I, I fully take the point that it looks like a Sindh regional party now, and it may be that that's how it works out. And if had you asked me this question like two years ago, I'd have thought that was the case. It, it seems to me since then that uh, Bilal Bhutto has, you know, at least put forward the ambition to be a national leader. Uh, will the PTI have, this is Imran Khan's uh, political party, have uh, enough political sustainability to be a force in 10, 15 years? Well, if Imran himself is you know, not a young man, uh, if he's no longer politically active, will the PTI be a national party vying for power? I doubt it. I'd have thought that would fade away fairly quickly. Uh, so you just have got to ask the question who the army would be prepared to work with. Uh, it seems that the Sharif family from PMLN have... Uh, you know, made it pretty clear that they do not want to work with the army anymore. I mean, it may be that will change, but what they're saying is, is very, very strong on this issue. Uh, so when you cast around for uh, politicians who might be willing to make the adjustments necessary to make the army feel comfortable, I'd have thought uh, there aren't that many left, and he's one of them. Thank you. Um, let me see if uh, Hassan Abbas is ready with his comment or question. Thank you so much, Shaja and Ovan. Uh, first, um, congratulations, on I had a chance to uh, read your book. Um, fascinating read. Um, really enjoyed it, I must tell you. Um, my question is, um, as a, referring to some of your uh, comments also on dynastic politics, but also have you, uh, you can, if you would like, share with your, your audience um, how you see the Pakistan People's Party as a movement. I mean, absolutely. Today, it's seen in a context of regional context, Sindh synth politics, um, um, dynastic politics. But by, when it had come into power, and it had, it, it was very strong as a movement. It, it was a leftist movement to say. How do you see the role of People's Party as a left-leaning party, which had challenged religious extremists when no one was doing it? 
Benazir Bhutto to give credit. She had stood up against extremists when no one else was doing it. It was not popular, fashionable, uh, standing up against, uh, against Zia. Do you see this party and it, the way it had empowered the intellectuals um, and writers that, that no other party had done in Pakistan's history? Do you see that potential, which is in the past, to be relevant to mainstream Pakistan again in terms of standing up for democracy, the progressive rights, uh, whether it is with Bilawal Bhutto or somebody else, because party is much larger than than that dynasty as well. Uh, I would say. Do do you agree? Well, that's the that's the question, isn't it? Is 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 it bigger than than the family? And I mean, there have been key moments in the family's history. For example, when Zulfikar Ali Bhutto was arrested uh, prior to his uh, being hanged, uh, when you know the party could have uh, gone under the leadership of non-family members, and I mean that was in fact the plan. Uh, initially for others to take over. And in fact, uh, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto's wife uh, took over. So uh, the, there have been moments uh, where you wonder, is this just a family uh, enterprise or family business? Uh, or is this actually a broad social and political movement? And I think for, for it to be the latter, you would think some leadership positions at least, you know, maybe not the leader, but some significant power would have to be held uh, by others, which has not really uh, been the case. Uh, so I, I think that is a limiting factor on the PPP as a social movement, that we're now into the third generation uh, of family leadership. I mean, that's bound to make an impact on how much people are willing to uh, discuss within the party circles, because they all know where all the decisions are taken. Let's see if um, Kamran Bukhari is ready with his question. Thank you, Shuja. Thank you, Owen. And thank you, everybody who organized this panel. Fascinating. Um, I haven't read your book, Owen, yet, but uh, I look forward to it. Um, my question, uh, I want to take you back to the assassination. And, and I want to uh, ask you a question that has a larger sort of uh, civil military relations dynamic to it or angle. So you mentioned that there were elements of the state that knew, and uh, we, you talked about how DGISI, uh, like the night before, came and said, hey, this is going to happen, It's a and their prediction came true. So my question is, uh, what was it about Benazir Bhutto that her, uh, you know, the perpetrators really needed to eliminate her? What, what was that imperative? I mean, look, you don't really, what kind of threat did she pose and then to whom? Uh, because I asked that question because we're moving forward, we're getting into a very volatile situation with Nawaz Sharif openly calling out, uh, you know, the head of the ISI and the head of the army uh, in, in less than charitable terms. And, and that, you know, can we see something, you know, uh, along the same lines of, you know, eliminating these people because they represent a, a threat. Um, and then, of course, you know, the question is, did to what extent did elements of the state have a role to play in, in Benazir Bhutto's death? And then, of course, if Pakistan is going to move towards some semblance of civilianization, some semblance of where civilians have some form of, you know, share of actual power, um, and then, you know, they're dependent on a security establishment that has these murky links and isn't like a coherent entity. So I'm just going to leave it there and get, would love your thoughts. So, so I think different people, different people have different interests. Uh, the, uh, I think Al-Qaeda were looking for a high profile attack uh, at a time when they didn't have much strength on the ground and weren't able really to mount a significant global attack. Uh, so a high profile global figure in Pakistan suited them quite well at the time. And that they, you know, it was something that they could claim, as they would put it, credit for later. I think the Taliban had a slightly different idea that the, she was uh, a woman, that she was very pro-American, that she was hostile to the religious parties. So I think they had their interest. And uh, to the extent that people in the state were hostile to her. I do think it's centered basically on this um, nuclear issue. I don't think uh, uh, the allegations they made about her making money and all the rest of it was a serious issue for them. But the idea that uh, she said in Washington uh, just days before she returned 
to uh, Pakistan that she would hand over uh, A.Q. Khan, the Pakistan leading nuclear scientist, to the IAEA for questioning, I think that was a real problem. And uh, now Sharif responded immediately by saying, this is her main opponent politically, that uh, he would not do that. Uh, he understood the significance of that statement, which, by the way, was given quite casually. It was, I've, I've replayed the tape where she said this, and it was the last question in a session in Washington with one of the Middle East think tanks over there uh, in quite a prestigious setting in some I don't know, Congress type building. I think maybe one of the outer buildings of Congress or something. So quite a high profile event. But nonetheless, it was uh, a good question that someone asked right at the end of it that prompted this remark from her about uh, handing over A.Q. Khan, which sounded the way she worded it, that it was quite um, carefully thought through and that um, you know, it was possibly something she discussed with the U.S. administration, but it wasn't uh, something that she was keen to promote as a, you know, a, a pitch for getting power in Pakistan, obviously. So, so, so I think that issue was there and was quite important. So, but so, so lots of people had different uh, reasons for wanting her gone. I don't think we can... Uh eliminate the possibility of, an, uh, of a false flag operation also, given the murky situation in Pakistan at that time or at any time. Uh, so let me um, move to the questions we've received now from the audience. And, and one of the you know, many interesting questions that have come are um, Peter Galbraith, uh, whom you know, and whom, uh, who was a friend of Benazir Bhutto has sent a question. Uh, if you had a truth serum that worked, uh, who in the Pakistan military would you want to interview about Benazir Bhutto's murder? And what questions might you want to ask? Well, I would clearly want to uh, talk to uh, the former head of the ISI, who uh, did have advanced knowledge of the plot as he uh, discussed it with her. I don't think it'd be an awful lot of point. I mean, I've talked to General Musharraf about it and uh, he is, well, I've had a truth serum, I suppose it would be quite interesting. Uh, I mean, uh, who knows? But I mean, his his uh, his defense on this has been rock solid and he hasn't given an inch on it um, uh, ever since the event uh, happened. Uh, you know, I'm sure there are officers uh, or retired officers, um, some of whom, you know, are no longer with us, uh, who would, if they had a truth serum, have had information about the plot about the Taliban plot. I mean, the one thing I have no evidence of is did they commission, did anyone in the state commission the Taliban to do it? I mean, I, I think Al-Qaeda was involved in the commissioning, was the state, I can't say the state was involved in the commissioning of it, but were the, was there knowledge of this quite, you know, long running plot with lots of people involved? And afterwards, I have to say, virtually everyone involved was murdered in various different circumstances uh, during the let's say a year or 18 months afterwards so all the officers involved in 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 those events it would be fascinating to have a truth serum we'll keep hoping um i have another question from yelena uh, bieberman she is a senior fellow at the south asia center and she says uh, she wants to know about family dynamics um, not all families are cohesive enough to be able to work together to seize and maintain power uh, what made the Bhutto family uh, so high functioning and so cohesive? Yeah, uh, it, 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 I mean, they are astonishingly ambitious and uh, quite well, and, and, and they have been for a very long time. I mean, if you look at the big uh, political families in the States, in Britain, Pakistan, I mean, there's normally a generation or two that uh, lose interest in matters of power and take greater interest in hedonism or having a good time. Uh, and there is such generation, but I mean, it was back in something like the 1890s uh, in the Bhutto's case. And since then they have been, you know, pretty committed to uh, political lives and to, to winning power. Uh, I guess some of that is passed on generation to generation. I guess the political context allows it to happen uh, in that uh, there is this political base that is a result of the family's uh, heritage and that, that does give each generation the opportunity uh, to vie for power. Uh, and so I, I, I guess that's the best I can do. I mean, it, it, but it is remarkable how ambitious each generation has been. 
We have another question uh, going back to political dynasties to see if you have any further thoughts on the benefits and shortcomings of political dynasties. Um, I mean, do they do have any do they have any good at this particular stage in the life of Pakistan? Well, one of the interesting things I, I tried to work out was whether they have consistent values that have passed generation uh, down from generation to generation, which is an interesting thought. And, uh, you know, pe people do sort of almost inherit political positions, which is quite strange when you think about it, but they seem to. Uh, and yet, I mean, I don't think that really is the case when I thought about it, because if you take Zulfikarni Bhutto's father, uh, Sir Shah Nawaz Bhutto, he was actually quite sectarian in his attitudes from what I could see, and he was you know, quite hostile to Hindus in Sindh. Uh, and and you know, said so uh, quite plainly in various places that it's on the public record. So uh, the attack, one of the, yeah, one of the values of the party certainly has been a commitment to protect minorities, and that's lasted since Zulfikarli Bhutto through to the current day, with some notable exceptions, such as Zulfikarli Bhutto's action on on the Emirates. But nonetheless, as a general stance, that has been there. But it didn't wasn't actually inherited from the family way back. So I think though these things are mutable and and. You know, the families can adapt and change and uh, obviously there's political pragmatism involved. It's all the minority votes are strong for the Bhutos and that is something they want to preserve. Uh, so, no, I've not found that actually this idea of inherited values is very substantial. You mentioned the Amadi issue and a question from MJ Bars uh, says how far uh, can Zulfikar Ali Bhutto be held responsible for opening the door to extremism by aligning with a lobby that demanded that they be declared non-Muslims? If you recall in 1977, when he was under great threat from the street bar uh, following uh, the allegations of a rigged election, he did a number of things that gave room to the religious right. He declared Friday to be the the, the national weekend holiday rather than the previous Sunday, Saturday and Sunday. Um, and he also uh, allowed the passage of the legislation that declared the Ahmadis to be non-Muslims. And he also banned alcohol, um, which took uh, a step away from his successor, Ziaul Haq, who would have preferred to have done that himself. Um, so uh, he ceded a lot of ground to the right. Uh, do you think it actually strengthened the right in any meaningful way? Well, I mean, he, he certainly did all those things and, and some of them are, are greatly regretted by many Pakistanis to, to this day. But no, I mean, uh, what emboldened the violent jihadist right or the, just the politicized Islamist right uh, goes way beyond Zulfikar Ali Bhutto. I mean, it's a global trend. General Zia certainly had far more to do with it than uh, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto did. The Americans had quite a lot to do with it, with the uh, financing of Mujahideen for so many years. The Saudis had quite, you know, there, there are lots of people who, who, who had plenty to do with this. Uh, I think Zulfikar Ali Bhutto's role while over the Emirates is pretty reprehensible was uh, quite a minor bit part. Um, here's another question um, about Zulfikar Ali Bhutto from uh, Rashid Zaman, who says, uh, what do you see uh, was the role of Zulfikar Ali Bhutto in 1970-71 leading up to the independence of Bangladesh? This is a huge question that has been much debated in Pakistani history. Oh, his role in, 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 in the prior to Bangladesh. Yes. So, so um, well, uh, the accusation made against him uh, is that uh, he put his personal ambition above the national unity of Pakistan and that he um, acted in a way that would ensure he became the leader of what was then West Pakistan, uh, even though it meant the dismemberment of the country. Uh, you know, I, 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 he, Lots of people were involved in that uh, process. Uh, there was Yaya, there was Majib, and there was uh, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto. And neither of them, I mean, obviously for Majib, it was the desired outcome. Uh, for Yaya uh, and Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, it was uh, you know, less desired by Yaya, more tolerable perhaps to Bhutto. But it's a complicated story. I go through it in quite a lot of detail. And uh, I think all three, you know, have involvement in that outcome. Um, there's another question about um, the party itself. Um, 
which is when Bilawal was made co-chairman of the party um, mm. by his father, was there resentment? Or did you detect in your conversation with party members, was there resentment among senior PPP members uh, that he was a novice who was being given the top slot? Oh, not really, no. I mean, I, I, I was there actually when I was um, at the funeral of Benazir Bhutto and uh, that announcement was made. And no, I think it was more a question of people being uh, surprised that Asif Sadari had assumed the leadership quite so smoothly uh, as he did and that the political will of Benazir, which I've, to my knowledge, established to be a totally genuine document, uh, did name Asif Sadari as the uh, successor. So, no, I think, I think the attention was much more, oh gosh, is, is Asif Sadari going to take over rather than is Bilal in the frame? We have another anonymous question. Um, this is uh, about if Benazir Bhutto was alive today, uh, how would Pakistan-US relations be different or would they not be different? Well, I guess it'd be a question of whether she'd be uh, in power. And, you know, I mean, I think there's no doubt that she had very good connections in the United States. I mean, not overwhelmingly good when she was returning uh, back to Pakistan, as Peter Galbraith knows very well, uh, who's just spoken earlier or contributed a question earlier, when she wanted protection from the American state, when she went back to Pakistan, realizing that her life was at risk, uh, she didn't really get it. Uh, so the, the, you know, there were limits to uh, the American uh, support for her. But nonetheless, she did have a good relationship with a lot of important people in Washington, and they did have uh, an understanding of her politics and, and were clearly willing to work with her. So uh, that, to, to all that extent, the, there would be, um, you know, some, some connections between her and Washington. But I, I, I'm, I'm sure those involved in these processes would agree that the national interests of the two countries, the militaries, the, all the stuff that goes on uh, in framing a relationship between two countries like Pakistan and the United States do go beyond the role of uh, individuals. To, uh, I'm just saying they're unimportant, but there, there are a lot of other important things going on. Thank you, Owen. Um, there are a number of questions that came in, uh, I think probably before you gave your explanation about the assassination, a lot of questions about who else could have been involved and you know what was the motivation and who could have orchestrated the assassination. But I think uh, you've answered uh, most of those and the book has much more detail that I would recommend to people that are asking those questions. Uh, there's one about uh, the Bhutto dynasty, uh, and this is from Tahir Wadud Malik, who says, uh, do you see Fatima Bhutto eventually stepping up to the PPP podium as some of the old guard would like her to, and why or why not? Uh, well, she says she has no ambition to do so, and is quite convincing on the subject. I mean, she's living, uh, in London, I think, at the time, I don't know how much of the time, but I, I think she's here some of the time. And, and she, you know, is quite determined that she's not uh, interested. And I guess by this stage, if she was going to be politically active, probably the moment would have passed wouldn't it, for her to do that. I'm not quite sure how old she is, but I mean, she's, uh, you know, she, 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 she's older than Bilal. Well, I'm sure that's right. So she, she yeah, the leadership is with Bilal uh, just now. And... Uh, We'll see what he does with it, but I can't imagine that it would be easy for anyone to challenge him until he's ready to go in terms of his management of the party. Um, there's another question about uh, the issue of the Bhuttos being Shia uh, in Pakistan's politics. Sectarian uh, connections often play a role. Do you think, uh, this is a question from Tasavar Shah, do you think this was uh, one of the factors that may have led uh, the right-wing Islamic uh, Orthodox Taliban to have targeted her? Well, it's, it's not quite as simple as that. I mean, yes, in a sense, but I mean, in fact, they'd be wrong because she wasn't Shia. Uh, and uh, Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto always said he was Sunni. Uh, he she was married in a Sunni ceremony. I mean, she said herself she was uh, Sunni and that Asif Sadari was Shia. 
uh, these things are more fluid than uh, we, well, that I appreciated anyway before going into this whole issue, which was extremely difficult to pin down. Uh, but it, I'm clear that uh, a lot of the reputation of Pakistan that the family is Shia is not entirely correct. Uh, that there are Shias within, for instance, Sanam Bhutto, put his sister says she is Shia, where her sister wasn't. Uh, and that you know, it's, uh, it is quite fluid. Uh, Sadari may have moved towards Shia uh, affiliation during, life and then during his presidency, been willing to try and sort of try both, try, try and you know, work with both Sunni and Shia in different contexts. Uh, so it, it's, it's complex, uh, but it's a misperception. Let me go back to a question that Madhya still raised, which was, uh, is the People's Party now confined to being a provincial party? One of the provinces uh, which gave a lot of support to the People's Party originally uh, at its founding was uh, the Northwest Frontier Province, now Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. In your conversations with people inside the party and outside, in your own travel, uh, in the border region, um, do you see the People's Party having any traction in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa? Well, some, but I mean not. I mean, I, I, I do take the I fully take the point at the moment. Not much, you know, and uh, it's still there. I mean, there, there is a there is a party structure, you know, there, and there are some leaders there, local leaders uh, there. But you know, I just think you have to think that these things do change quite uh, quickly in Pakistan and if uh, everyone likes a winner you know and if uh, someone looks like becoming prime minister it looks like they've got a real chance of of winning because of army support because of media support maybe because of whatever the circumstances are because of lack of opposition because of timing because of whatever then suddenly quite important people will start saying well you know i always wanted to stand for the ppp actually now i come to think of it uh, and uh, that you know the support will will come in i'm sorry about the fading light here by the way so it's, uh, it's diminishing rather quickly in london uh but uh, sorry about that uh, so, so so yes i mean i think i think you know at the moment no but i don't think that means it's forever well politics in pakistan uh, is often uh, uh operating under a coat of many colors uh, people are willing to change their colors as as the need emerges um but let me uh, at this point um uh, ask uh, you if if you wouldn't mind uh, helping us look to the future a little bit and uh, uh, go to your book and and if you could read the last eleven lines of the book because a lot of questions have been raised about the future of the dynasty, the future of the party, and the future of Bilabal Bhutto and and you certainly have thought about it because you end your book with these. 11 lines and they're quite telling. Would you mind reading those lines for us? I will do my best in this fading light. I just tried to switch the lights on, but I didn't find the right switch. Uh, so, but yes, I can just about make out the, um, the, 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 the words here. Uh, so it certainly is possible to imagine a scenario in which the army would need to install a civilian, at least a modicum of intimacy, meaning that it might turn to Bilal as one of the few civilian politicians with general, genuine national visibility. The history of the Bhutto family suggests that if that moment does come, Bilal will probably make the necessary adjustments. He may give speeches demanding democracy, but his mother and grandfather did that too, and yet found a way to work with the army. Indeed, ever since Dodo Khan Bhutto, who's sort of mid 19th century, uh, one of their sort of uh, big, 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 big family member of building the estates up, uh, he worked out how to manipulate the British colonialists so as to secure uh, the financial viability of his estates. The Bhutto's have always believed that when the ultimate prize of power is at stake, a deal can be done. So that's the sort of point I've been making through this uh, hour, that I think that you know, they are pragmatic and always have been. And it hasn't, they, clearly their relationship with the army has never been stable and it's never, you know, <laughs> but both of them ended up dead uh, and, and you know, it's, it's never been uh, an easy situation with the army but there have been with both Benazir and Zulfikar there were times when they did those deals. And do you think that if there was this uh, desire on his part uh, with or without his father's blessings to make a deal 
with the military? Would the military be prepared, given its current situation, to make a deal uh, with uh, the People's Party? Yes, I hope this is better. Okay. <laughs> a bit of light on the matter. Uh, y y yes, um, I, 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 no, no. I, th I do think both sides could could it could be uh, in, in their mutual interest to 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 do that, and uh, particularly you know with the media as it is now. I mean, Imran Khan has emerged as a genuinely new leader in Pakistan, and maybe there'll be there'll be people doing that in the future. But the history of the country is that these families uh, do produce uh, people who the national debate. Uh, but you know, getting this media uh, oomph at the beginning of a career does often come with with familial relationships, and 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 you know, it, Pakistan's no different. We haven't talked about India at all, but uh, one of the uh, interesting attacks that has been launched over time against uh, Benazir Bhutto's government and the People's Party has been that they they were soft on India, and Nawaz Sharif in particular has used that as a a means of, of staking out a position for himself, which is much more aligned with that of the military. Uh, how do you see the India factor playing in all of this? Well, you have to remember that Nawaz Sharif is now accused of being an Indian agent, I think almost, uh, by uh, some of his opponents in Pakistan and uh, is regularly denounced for, I mean, I saw something about why is it that whenever one of his trials comes up, there's unrest at the border, you know, with all this suggestion that India is fact now Sharif uh, as their guy in in Pakistan. So I mean that, that whole question of uh, Indian influence on uh, the civilian politicians is not restricted to just the Bhutto's, but you're right. I mean that 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 accusation has been made, but I think it'll be made uh, against any civilian politician who's seen to you know, be out of favour at the time. Owen, thank you so much for, for having this conversation with me. I think uh, it would be appropriate at this point for me to ask Shamila Chaudhary uh, to come in with her comment or uh, and or question and also to, to wrap up this discussion for us. Thank you so much, Shuja. And I want to thank the South Asia Center for um, hosting this conversation and allowing the American Pakistan Foundation to co-host. Um, Owen, you've written something so amazing for every student of Pakistan and uh, every student of South Asia, frankly, because what the story of this family is so intertwined with the story of um, civil military relations in Pakistan, of dynastic politics, of the elite capture that has happened in, in what is now Pakistan and what has evolved over the years to become this country that's run by, you know, maybe a hundred or so families that want to control and sustain themselves. And I, you know, in the course of your discussion, I, it occurred to me, it was like, well, obviously the political party is just one form or one tool of elite capture and the Bhuttos have done it quite well. Um, however, they're in a moment now where they're not able to actually utilize the power that they've had in the past. And the the link there or the 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 factor there is the variable there is the army right and so if the army so chooses to tap into that um, lever of power then we may see the rise of the butto name again um, and so it's and with the right person of course and as you talked about benazir it was clear that she was the right person for a lot of stakeholders um similarly um you know, Zulfikar Bhutto was also that for a certain amount of time. And as the tides of power and influence change in Pakistan, so do kind of the, the role of these dynastic families. Um, I have to say that I, um, you know, I listened to this discussion with a great amount of nostalgia as well. Um, for those of us who um, are of Pakistani descent in the United States who came to America in the 80s, a lot of our parents came of age in Pakistan during the rise of, of Zulfi Bhutto. And so, you know, we've heard these stories as part of our sense of, you know, imagined homeland. And whether you were a fan of his or not, it doesn't matter. It's so much ingrained in our sense of, of history and um, who we are um, as a political people. So I found that um, fascinating. And I've just ordered the book, so I'm really excited to, to read it for um, those reasons. And I just, I wanna include, or I wanna conclude on one question, which is, you know, we spent a lot of the time today talking about um, dynastic politics and 
Um, as we, you know, in the United States have an election where, you know, there's a, with the president whose family has been very much involved in the past four years. And um, it it seems to us that we're not as familiar with family dynasties where, you know, but we actually are. We, we have a lot of similarities in the United States when we look at dynasties. And I would just ask ourselves, like, what is the function of a family political party of, of these dynasties? And at some point, do they outlive their functions? Um, what purpose do they serve? They they do have this power and ability to tap into something very visceral and emotional. And I'm seeing that here in the United States. And I'm using my lessons of knowing and um, understanding Pakistan to, to figure out what's happening here. So I never thought I would do that or say that, but um, which makes, I think, your book all the more compelling for everyone to read, not just um, students of Pakistan and of South Asia. So um, with that, I just thank you for that. And I, I look forward to, to reading and learning more. Back to you, Shuja. Thank you. And, and thank you again to Owen uh, Bennett Jones uh, and to Madhya Afzal and Hassan Abbas and Kamran Bukhari, and of course, to the American Pakistan Foundation and Shamila Chaudhary. And thank you to all the the audience that sent questions. I'm sorry that we couldn't get every single one answered, but uh, we hope that this discussion will continue online uh, when we post this. Thank you, Owen. Thanks very much indeed.